my name is R Raquel Woods, and I'm the Gulf State Regional Director here at NCAT, National Center for Appropriate Technology. Um, we cover five states, which are Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. However, we, choose, we chose to do workshops in Arkansas because this is one of our neighboring states, and we wanted to cover some of the workshops in Arkansas as well as Mississippi. So what I'll do now, we'll, we'll start the video. Share sound zone. Okay. Can everyone see the screen? Okay, great. And we'll get started. I'm Travis Apple. I'm Ashley Apple. We're a diversified uh, vegetable and fruit farm. We also raise pigs. Um, we have about 30 pigs right now. Um, we started in the spring with strawberries um, being our biggest crop of the year. And uh, from there we transitioned into uh, multiple vegetables, squash, cucumbers, eggplant, okra. We grow a lot of tomatoes. About anything you can think of, we try to grow. Um, and then we finish our season with the pumpkin patch. We, uh, this is what both of us do full time. So we don't have other jobs. So we count on the farm to produce all of our income. So, so that's a lot of risk. Um, that's one of the reasons why we try to diversify as a farm. Obviously, you know, if we, if we miss out on one of our large things like strawberries, if we have some sort of event, wipe them all out, then th that's a big hit for us because, you know, that is all of our income or a big, a big portion of it. The risk associated with insects on our farm um, varies from year to year, but uh, this year it was pretty significant. Um, we had large populations of uh, army worms and different types of caterpillars that were uh, destroying our tomato crop. We also saw some, uh, a lot of cucumber beetle damage this year. So here at Apple Farms, I would say we definitely have a human risk. Um, labor is a big thing for us. We do um, have pick your own operation for our strawberries, but that doesn't get them all picked. And so we have to have labor. And so we have to count on humans to come and, and work for us. And if they don't show up or um, get everything picked, then we lose out on that income from, from that harvest. Seasonal labor is always hard to find. Um, we, we struggle with it every year. We always struggle finding labor and finding people that want to work and that um, can work efficiently and uh, get the job done. We grow tomatoes in this tunnel uh, through the summer and we got to have people to tie those tomato plants up. And you know, we got to have people to uh, tie tomatoes up in the back too and stake tomatoes and, and uh, pick the vegetables. Production is a huge risk for us, especially when we come, you know, to our main crops. But th that's one of the reasons for diversification. We have a large pick-your-own operation with strawberries. So um, we have a lot of people out here that are actually on the farm picking, um, and there's a lot of risk with that. You know, they have to walk out into the strawberry patch. There's rocks, there's holes, there's a big risk for somebody getting hurt or um, you know, getting bit, or, or there's, there's a lot of things that could happen. And so that's a huge risk for us, a big liability. Um, so we have to make sure that we have insurance that covers that liability. We also have a store on the farm. And so not just strawberry season, but all season long, all through the summer, we have people coming. They're driving up to the farm, um, getting out, walking up steps across the deck, coming inside. And so, you know, just someone falling or getting hurt, that's a big risk and that could come back on us and, and be a hard hit. So having coverage to protect us from that is, is a big, big deal. The advice I would give to a, a new farmer would be to uh, start out by working at another farm, gain some knowledge and uh, some on the job training, being a, uh, a worker on an actual farm that, that does whatever that you think that you want to do. You can't just go out in the field and start planting something and then expect to just make money. There's a lot of things that go with it, a lot of business uh, that goes with having a farm, like record keeping, 
um, accounting, finance, you got a budget, you got a plan. You know, this is all that we do and it's seasonal. So, you know, we have four, three or four months out of the year that we don't really have income coming in. And so we have to budget our income and make sure that what we make, you know, throughout the season we can use for the whole year. Um, and then keeping those records, you know, come tax time, we have to have all of this stuff in place and um, be able to, you know, have it to prepare a tax return and trying to go back and remember it and figure it out, especially being a cash heavy business, you know, we have to keep keep records of that as we go. And that way you're not having to figure that out all like after after you've already produced everything and gotten your income and then try to figure out how to keep the records for that. All right. Do, do anyone have any questions for Travis and Ashley? Does anyone have any questions? Well, uh, maybe I shouldn't ask one, but I'm curious because I love high tunnels. And um, did you by any chance get any, uh, use any conservation programs? We have a demonstration farm here in Montana and we used an equip funding to get a high tunnel. Um, I was just wondering if you, pursued that or looked into that as a way to lower the cost of obtaining a high tunnel. Yeah, we did. Um, we used the NCAT um, program, equip the same equip. program you're talking about. The NRCS, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, NRCS. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, we, we have two high tunnels uh, right beside each other and both of them we use the same program for uh, helped us out tremendously. Is there anything you all would like to add to the video? Kind of. I wish it hadn't been raining that day. <laughs> yeah. Things I maybe would have looked a little prettier. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it's a beautiful farm. Everyone, it's a very beautiful farm. Um, had it not been raining, you know, we could have uh, flown the drone over the farm, so you could have really gotten a, a really good view of it. Yeah, but it's a really beautiful farm. You, you guys would have to see it. Come to Springdale, Arkansas, to see it. And patronize Apple Farms. <laughs> yeah. So, anybody like to have any questions or like, uh, or, or is there anything that y'all feel like we missed uh, that we could that we could share with with some um, some of our growers? Here? You know, again, I'm always interested in insurance, but um, okay. and a question I get a lot, and I'm not as good. I'm and I deal with crop insurance. But liability insurance that you discuss, is that hard to get? Is that costly? Is it a significant expense? And I mean, I guess you just decided you better have it because you're you picking all that. But um, it, anyway, maybe you could share later with Rock and others because finding folks that provide that and the lowest cost has not been something I've, I know a little bit of where to look, but it, it's kind of, it's not that obvious always. No, it's not. I mean, it's, it's not easy to find that you, you can't just call up, you know, your regular insurance agent and, and get that insurance. It's a little bit more difficult to find um, to get that coverage that you need as far as like someone being out there and getting hurt or whatever um, and making sure that the coverage you have actually does cover those things. Um, it's, it's definitely not easy to find. <laughs> Was it relatively expensive? I'm just, uh, I'm just curious about the cost. Um, it, I mean, regular, like, um, the property insurance has a little bit of liability coverage on it and it's not, it's not, it's not significantly bad. Um, but we're also kind of, uh, exploring some different options right now too for that coverage. So I couldn't give you an exact amount because we're still kind of, working on that no i was born just on the idea of it was onerous you know it was it was horrible <laughs> Did it, you know, make life miserable um, for you <laughs> it's not horrible but i mean i think it's just one of those things like it doesn't really matter you kind of have to do it so yeah it's just just part of the operation you know i think for people that that uh, deal with agri tourism um you know it's just a something that you have to have and you know it's going to cost what it costs so but uh, 
we don't have like livestock that you pet uh, like some of these other places do. And I think you get into that and it's probably a whole lot more expensive than what we've got going on. So. All right, let's talk about, I, I remember when we were there, the, the livestock portion of it, and you may mention of how you, you sell the, the, the livestock at your farm. Kind of explain to the audience how that, the, how, how that ties in with um, your livestock operation. So we started um, with selling retail cuts. Of, we, we have pigs, and so it's, it's just pork right now. Um, we started out selling retail cuts uh, at the store and when we would go to farmer's market. So, you know, if somebody just wanted to come buy some pork chops, they could just get a package of pork chops. Um, with COVID, everything changed because the USDA butchers booked up for, you know, two years or more. And then they, you know, our butcher changed their whole operation and, and they weren't doing pigs like they, they did prior to COVID. And so we had to change up our whole model and um, we've moved now to where we just sell whole and half hogs. So our customers will order, you know, if they want to have, they order it um, through us. And then we go probably three, three times, three or four times a year to the butcher. And we just sell it directly, you know, to the customer like that. You don't have to use the USDA butcher um, because they're getting the whole or half thing. Um, they fill out their cut sheet, specify what they want and, and work with the butcher that we choose to do that. And it's working out. Um, it's working out well for us. Great. Great. Just, I might add, that's exactly what happened in Montana as well. So you weren't unique in that. And yeah, my daughter runs a food hub and uh, in Billings, Montana, and it was crisis in terms of getting butch getting lined up to get butchering and slaughtering done. Even for state inspection, was crazy, yeah. and it's, it's starting to get a little bit better, but it's still a, it's a huge issue. Yeah, we used to could you know like a month before or something call up the butcher and say, okay, we're we're going to be wanting to come in the next few weeks, um, but now yeah, we're still probably scheduling six months in advance just even without the usda butcher yeah i think it was a nationwide um uh, kind of thing that happened uh with covid and stuff but it uh it affected our business but it i mean ultimately it's really made things easier for us because we're we're not having to store the meat in the freezer you know we're getting rid of a half a pig at, or a whole pig at a time and it's a uh, kind of a blessing i guess instead of processing maybe four at a time we're processing 10 12 at a time so okay. so we often talk about when covid hit what what was some of the did you all have to go through any type of risk factors that that you had to change i know you just talked about the pork part of it finding a butcher or, or switch your selling models to whole and half hogs to customers is there anything that you had to kind of switch up with customers for us like when the summer hit did you still have the you pick portion of it uh going on or, or did you have to hire labor uh to actually have that um to to um how did you kind of make that adjustment we we got really nervous um because our season with strawberries starts like mid to late april and that was like prime time right in the beginning of covid and so we got really nervous. We didn't know if people were going to come out or would want to be out there and close to other people. Um, some of the other farms in our area didn't even open for you pick, but you know, for us, if you, if we don't open for you pick, you know, that's that many more people we have to find to come work and pick them. Um, so we, we did, we opened up, um, we set up, we had to do things a lot differently. You know, we had to manage the rows, um, make them one way so that people could, you know, not run into each other on the rows. We had hand washing and sanitizing stations um, that, you know, we hadn't done that prior to COVID. Um, but we got really nervous, but we were, that was, that was our busiest season, I would say, probably ever. Um, I think people were ready to get outside. And so it ended up being good for us. Um, people didn't seem to mind everyone. Some people were wearing masks. Some people weren't. Um, and that, that carried on throughout the summer. We actually didn't even go to the, that was our first season to not go to farmer's market. We sold everything at the store at the farm. So yeah, we, we stayed, we stayed really busy that season. <laughs> yeah. These past two seasons have been record years by far. Um, 
people trying to support a local business, I think, for one, and trying to know where their food's coming from. It's, uh, um, I guess it's happened everywhere from what I talked to other farmers and stuff, um, every state. Um, their farms are just, they can't produce enough stuff um, to sell. I mean, which is a good thing, you know. We did get nervous, you know, we didn't have any mandates saying that we couldn't open, but we didn't know, you know, they that, that was a time when things were changing daily. And so we didn't know at some point if the governor was going to say, you know, nobody can go to farms or, you know, what was going to happen. So it was kind of day to day. Um, same with the store, you know, some, some stores had to close down. We didn't have to. Um, so it, it, it definitely was a scary time, yeah. but yeah. it was okay. There wasn't a whole lot of mandates really that came down with the ag, uh, from, from the ag uh, portion of, of the, the, the rules or whatever that the states or national laws were regulating. So we, we really uh, were, were kind of unaffected, I guess you would say, as far as somebody mandating what we did or yeah, kind of thing. So I guess we got lucky that way too. Wow. Okay. That is great. I know because uh, during the time here in Mississippi, a lot of the growers were considering not planting. Some, some didn't plant. Some only planted a little because they didn't know how long the virus was going to be around once it got started here in Mississippi. So uh, we were just curious to know how you know, and, it, and I see you all have a, a ex, an excellent pivotal plan that you all were able to execute. So um, that is great. Um, and, you know, we're not, uh, I guess we should, I don't know, if, I don't think we mentioned it in the video, but we're a relatively small farm. So uh, we're kind of not uh, large scale production like uh, some people may be thinking, but you know, we got a one 10 acre farm and one other farm that's 16 acres, but we're relatively small in the, in the scheme of things as far as agriculture goes. So. Do you do any rotating with the animals to the, from, the, from that area into different sections of where you plant the vegetables? Not really. Um, mostly uh, keep the pigs down in the low areas where we can't grow anything. Um, we, we got some kind of flood zones when it rains a lot and uh, some of our property and I try to keep them in those areas uh, and we grow almost everything on plastic plastic culture um, so it, the rotation just doesn't really work out um, we rotate pastures um, but not between you know not between the crops and the and the pigs we haven't had enough land either was part of the problem until recently so maybe something that we do uh in the future okay. so okay all right travis and, and ashley thank you so much and uh we'll get started with uh jeff shesinski with crop insurance whole farm revenue crop insurance. take it away jeff yeah my name is jeff shesinski i'm in the our montana office in butte montana and uh, I've been working on crop insurance for maybe too many years. But um, <laughs> uh, I don't know how many presentations I've done around crop insurance, but I know it's over 100, it's over 100 for sure. Um, so um, I hope I don't go too fast and you can slow me down and ask questions too if I get carried away. First thing is, is that as, you, as we just learned, um, Crop insurance is only one way to mitigate risk in agriculture. Um, many, many uh, other ways to do it. And, and, and there are, are different kinds of risks be, besides the kind of yield losses and price losses that, and input price changes that might affect the financial operation, which crop insurance to a certain degree can handle. Um, and, and diversity. Diversity can be a source of, in itself, um, a way to reduce risk. And um, and many and the farm we're talking about today is highly diverse. And the program that I'm talking about today uh, is about a, a functioning for trying to help 
the uh, diversified folks uh, acquire some kind of insurance. Um, I do use jargon, and I know that's sometimes uh, hard on folks. Um, I use the term revenue risk. Um, it's really a combination of both price and yield risk, if you think about it. Um, yield risk is the risk that is one most people think about when they think about crop insurance. It's the it's the flood, it's the drought. It's in Hawaii, it's the volcanoes. That's literally true. Volcanic activity is a cause of loss. Um, and it affects yield. And that's often known as multiple peril because there's different <laughs> perils that can affect the yield of your crop. The revenue includes what, what would be called price risk. So in other words, you plant a crop at the beginning of the year, the strawberries are X dollars a pound or a carton and the market is flooded or whatever and the price decreases by the end. I just noticed that in, in this year, corn prices at the beginning of the year were something like $4 and now they're like $7. Anyway, it, it, you know, it, it, within one season, the price of something can change both up or down and therefore that's a, a price risk and revenue risk includes both of those. Approved insurance provider is the, there are 13 private companies that sell through the federal crop and pro program. And then you have agents who usually sell for one or more of these approved insurance providers. This is for the federal programs. There's, there are private policies and these companies will sell other private products, but I'm only talking about here is the federal program. Liability is the value of what is insured. And it's never 100% in crop insurance. It uh, can be as high as in some cases when you combine things up to 95%, but there's usually a deductible as there is in most insurance. Indemnity is just the, the, pay, the payment, what you get paid for your losses. And it's known as indemnity. And premium, I think everyone knows, is the cost. Um, crop insurance is a bit, federal crop insurance is a bit unusual in that it's a, it's a partnership between the private sector and, and the federal government. And, uh, and you have these AIPs in between the private insurance companies right in here. And then the federal crop insurance program, which is kind of overarching by the federal crop insurance corporation, but is generally operated and kind of day to day by the USDA agent called the risk management agency. They, they're the kind of people that manage the, the federal crop insurance program on a day to day basis. And there's this relationship where essentially the crop private companies are servicing the policies of the federal government that are made available to the to farmers and ranchers. And they for, for that they get paid. And then they also share in the revenue gain and risk. Um, just to give you a sense of the magnitude, um, this is just from 2021. It might not be the final numbers because it's probably still some policies being paid out for this crop year, but pretty close. And you can see that liability the, you know the federal crop insurance program it's covered it's quite a bit of money <laughs> almost 137 billion dollars worth of, of agricultural value being covered by the crop insurance 13.6 of that is is the total premiums collected but under federal crop insurance a lot most products uh, are are subsidized and some highly subsidized and overall 8.6 billion of that total cost, premium cost is paid by taxpayers. So it's a fairly highly subsidized, publicly subsidized program. Um, and this year so far, we've paid out 5.3 billion in payouts, losses so far. And we, it's pretty probably gonna be what it's gonna end up. And there's been 8.3 billion in gains. That means we actually collected the, the crop insurance program overall collected more in than it paid out. And that's another advantage the, the approved insurance providers have is that they share in the gain. They get some of that gain as part of their uh, participating in the joint private public sector program that crop insurance is. And this is some data just showing the gains and losses over the last few years. Um, and you can see the dark blue is the gain that the AIPs, the credit in, insurance providers gained, and then there's the actual net payment to the farmers. And you can see, and if you don't remember, I would, I do, because I was doing crop insurance, uh, the fiscal year 2012 was, was a horrible world, uh, nationwide, mostly drought, uh, one of the most significant um, 
risky years, let's say in the last few years, uh, 2011 wasn't all that much better, but you see the light blue. But as late, you can see that the payouts has been higher than uh, the pay, the net payments to AIPs has been higher than the payments to, to those who had losses. The other thing that is important here, because we're going to be talking about what are called specialty crops today, fruits and vegetables, tree nuts, dried fruits, horticulture crops. They even have um, medicinal herbs. And I like the aesthetic gratification, which I believe is flowers. <laughs> Although I suppose there's some other things that could be aesthetically. And these are considered specialty crops. Specialty crops aren't serviced that well by the federal crop insurance program. Um, this is just some rough data, but in 2017, that's the USDA census, there were roughly 242,000, 243,000 specialty crop farms, and they had a value of something like $87 billion uh, in, in that acreage. But the, the total value of all specialties covered was approximately, and it's hard to get that number, 2.8 billion, suggesting that we, a lot of specialty crops weren't covered. Uh, by crop insurance. And that's very different if you would look at, for instance, many of the commodity crops, they're highly uh, covered by insurance. So it's just something to FYI, and we'll, we'll see more of that later. Um, this is the Arkansas usage of crop insurance in 2021. And you can see I have this broken out by the types. Um, and as you can see, which is this rec replicates somewhat the national thing is you have your major commodity crops, they are, are using both yield and revenue types insurance, and they represent a significant proportion of the total coverage of federal crop insurance programs. You get to this pasture rangeland and forage, which is kind of an interesting rainfall index. We won't go into it. It's a fairly new program for livestock producers, and it's a very strange way, but, but that's actually fairly significant in Arkansas. But as we go down, whole farm revenue we will spend a lot of time with, which is fairly significant. And, and, but you can see in terms of specialty crops, we've got the fresh market tomatoes, and that's only uncertain. And it's only yield insurance, so it doesn't have that price. Uh, peaches yield only, grapes yield only. And grapes is kind of very interesting because there was really only one policy sold, uh, even though it's available in certain counties in, uh, in Arkansas, there was only one policy sold. So you can see, uh, what I'm saying is, is that even though there are uh, policies available for specialty crops, they are by far um, not as readily available as they are for most of your commodity crops. Okay, we're going to go look at what is the yield protection available for grapes in Arkansas. And you got to bear with me because I'm going to go online and hopefully this is going to work. Uh, and, and I'm going to have to do a new share. And I'm going to have to go to there. Does everyone see the new sharing? Somebody's give me an OK. Hello? OK, yeah, OK. okay. <laughs> it's hard for me sometimes to know if, 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 if what I successfully shared screen. This is a cool tool on the uh, RMA website. It's called the Map Viewer. And you have to get a little bit skilled in using it, but it's not too bad. First thing I always forget to do is to go to commodity programs. And essentially, even specialty crops are all called commodities. I'm not quite sure why RMA and USDA thinks of everything as a commodity, but they do. And, um, and I'll just pick the most recent year and I'll select a commodity. And you can see there's quite a list of commodities, including specialty crops. So you can see there's a lot of crops, but here's what's interesting. So if I go to grapes down here, and and uh, wait, it'll populate. Okay, so as you see here on this map, where you see those greens, green things, that's where you can get yield insurance for grapes. And let's look at Arkansas. And I can put Arkansas just so it'll beam in there a little closer, but it's, you can kind of see it from here. Two counties. So while there is grape specialty crop insurance yield insurance particularly, it's only available in two counties in Arkansas. Now there's something called a written agreement, which we won't discuss too much, it is that say you were in Madison County, you might be able to go to your crop insurance agent and, um, and con convince them to write a kind of a special policy 
kind of based on the Benton and Washington County programs. That's done by farmers. But as you can see, even though grapes are insurable for yield, it's only available in two counties. And, and you can see that it's not available for many counties. So I'm gonna, that's just to show you how you can look that up. And you can look that up for a whole bunch of different things. It's kind of fun to see what's available in your state. Um, now I gotta share the screen back to where I was. Okay, and share. Are we back? Say yes, someone, <laughs> just make sure. Yeah. Okay, cool, <laughs> we'll go on. Now I'm gonna tell you um, assessing insurable risk. This is a very, another cool tool that is put out by the South, it was, was created by the Southwest Climate Hub. They're a regional group that has been dealing with quiet and, and this gentleman that I got to know uh, created this and we're, we'll go see that and I'll show you what this, what this does. It's, uh, it's called the Ag Risk Viewer. Um, it has some issues, the data doesn't load. It, sometimes the data is a little bit behind, but it, it's, it'll give you an interesting look at the United States. Um, and, and this can be used if you're considering crop, crop insurance, um, because what it does, it, it provides uh, all the data from 1989 to 2020, all the policies sold and, and certain, uh, certain data on them, uh, certain metrics. And you can look at specific co commodities. So if I just, and you can look down to the county level, but let's just focus on the state level because that gets a little easier to see. And you can see that we're looking at the indemnities, the, val the value of payout from all these years in various states. And the darker the color, the more payouts they're with. So given that this is for those crops that were insurable, we can see that there have been lots of payouts in Texas, North Dakota, Iowa, uh, and even California. And Arkansas is down there, it's a little lighter colored. So, so one way I think of this is that given all the causes of loss in all the ways and given all the insurable crops, Texas, North Dakota, Iowa could be thought of as the riskier place to grow uh, crops, at least insurable crops. But let's just do one quick commodity change rather than looking at all crops. Let's look at, um, oh, let's just look at, at, at soybeans, okay? So now we're just gonna update that and we're gonna look at the same information, but only concerning soybeans. And you can see the map changes and Arkansas doesn't have all that much risky soybeans. The other thing, but you can see that- We can't soybean, see that, Josh. You can't see the map anymore? No. I'm gonna go on, because sometimes it's going off into the internet can be problematic. This is a cool tool. It will actually, you can look at your county level and you can see the causes of loss for all the different things that happened in your county by using that tool. So it's a good tool just to play around with. And it, sure, it only tells you the history, but it gives you a sense of what were the causes of loss for the crops in your county. That's the bottom line. Now, now I'm gonna talk about whole farm revenue because I think it's one of the most interesting thing to deal with when you're talking about diversified and specialized fruit and veggie operations. And one of its biggest advantages is that it's available in every single county in the United States. And, and it includes Hawaii and Alaska, which I couldn't fit onto the map easily. But unlike you see like grapes are only in certain counties, um, whole farm revenue is available everywhere. So if I even grow grapes in Montana, under a whole farm revenue, I could actually cover grape production. Probably high premium probably, but I could do it. And same thing with fresh market tomatoes. And I can get revenue protection. So I can get both price and yield protection for uh, my whole farm. And it's available everywhere. That's one of its big pluses. Um, whole farm revenue as whole farm revenue has only been available since the 2014 Farm Bill and was implemented in 2015. And uh, before that, there was a product called AGR, Adjusted Growth Revenue and Adjusted Growth Revenue Light, which were very similar. And that's why you see this data going back to 2006 in the chart, because that was the earlier version of whole farm revenue called AGR and AGR Light. And you can see with the creation of it, we had uh, an, an increase in policies up to 2017. And now we've seen a decline in 2021, unfortunately, 
is about 1900 and something. So it's continuing a decline. And there are reasons for that. And, uh, and, and it needs, in my opinion, and we've been working through several groups to try to reform all form so they can become usable. Um, but see the different number of types of crops insured. I mean, it, it, up to 300 different types of crops are included because whole farm is talking about the whole farm rather than just any specific crop you're insuring. And it gives you some issue, interesting of the, the, the amount of liability being covered. So here are the basics. For the one biggest way to think of this is that it ensures an estimate of the expected economic capacity of the farm to produce a gross revenue, not a net revenue, up to a maximum of some number. And it's, it's actually 8.5 million, or depending on how many crops can be up to like 10, 12 million. So there's a limit in terms of the total amount of coverage. If you are more than a roughly, a, and depending on the amount of things you grow, if you're above 12 million, this is not available to you. You have to go back to other individual policies. So that's a significant amount of the population. And it's based on your gross revenue. And that is determined by your tax records. So tax records are the way, uh, essentially, the policy assesses the capacity of your farm to generate revenue by looking at your taxes. And you'll notice that um, there's a benefit so in other words, if you don't have five years of tax records, then you're not eligible. So you have to have been an operating farm. So it's not for the very, very beginning farmer. Even if you're a beginning farmer or a veteran, you only need three to four years of, uh, of, of records. So there is some advantage for that. But still, it's not, you can't be like in your first year of operation. Why? Because I need some estimate of the economic capacity of the farm to generate revenue. And without that, they can't set a premium easily. It covers almost any product, uh, livestock and crops, up to a maximum, again, a maximum value. Oh, I said 10 to 17. I'm, I'm sorry. It does, that depends, again, on the number of products produced. However, the value of, of livestock, not agriculture. I don't know why they made it benefit for the agriculturalist, but anyway, of $2 million. So again, only $2 million in total coverage. If over 2 million, it's not available to cover. And not just for small diverse farms. Many very large farms use whole farm revenue. Some very large apple growers in Washington, and I noticed we had somebody from Washington, there's some very large apple growers that use whole farm revenue. In Montana, some very large grain and oil seed and pulse producers, and we were talking 10,000 acres, use whole farm revenue. And there's reasons. The indemnity payment won't be made until taxes are filed. This is probably one of the negative consequences. Is since it's based on your tax, until, say, you have your tax year, you had a loss, the adjuster comes out, assesses the loss, you file your taxes. Once your taxes are filed, that is used as the basis to determine your indemnity payment, which depending on when that, you know, like say your season ends November, you file your taxes in January, you get, you know, you have those filed taxes, then you can begin the process. So there's a lot of delayed payment, which is a negative. And um, other crop insurance policies on individual commodities will pay faster than that. So that is one of its drawbacks, but ultimately you'll get your payment. Um, it's the only crop and policy that incent incentivizes not extensively crop and livestock diversity. And in other words, it takes to heart that idea that the more diverse a farm is, the less risk year it is. And therefore up to seven crops, seven products really, could be livestock or crops, up to seven, you get a discounted premium and that discount can vary depending on the riskiness of those seven products you produce. But nonetheless, a, a, a more diverse farm will have a lower premium, which is another kind of, it's the only crop insurance policy that does such, it has such an incentive. Um, if you have an organic farm and your history is organic and you've been selling and your revenue generated is based on that higher value, let's say organic production, then it's already embedded in your, in your whole farm revenue policy. Because again, it's the economic capacity and the revenue, gross revenue generated, and that by sales of organics is going to be higher and therefore already embedded, which is a really cool thing, which is not as easy to do if you were 
for instance, getting an organic corn versus a non-organic corn policy that for like a yield or revenue, that would be more problematic. But this is like automatically takes care of the organic issues of price. Um, it only covers the value of the raw product. Uh, strawberry is not the value added from making strawberry jam. This can be very comp make it a little more complicated to the extent that the farmer does create value added products. Um, because of law, essentially federal law, um, although this is changing, that's another uh, digression, but uh, essentially it can only cover the actual production essentially to the field. You know, so the apple coming off the apple tree, but not the apple sauce. And so you have to backtrack and establish the historic capacity of the farm to, do, to, develop, to produce the value of raw products, not the value added. And so to the extent you have value added, that can make application more cumbersome. Premium subsidy and coverage improves with three or more products. And then you can get, if you have three or more commodities, defined commodities, you can get up to 85% coverage of your, of, of, of your approved revenue. Uh, and so you have a premium rate that lowers with each added product, again, up to seven tracks. You unfortunately also have to track your historic expenses. And if the historic average expenses do not meet 70% of the expenses in the insured year, your premium, your premium is reduced um, well, that's not actually right. I should have checked that. Anyway, there's an expense penalty. Your, your, it should say your indemnity is reduced. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't catch that. And, and, and anyway, and, and that's the only crop insurance policy in all the crop policy that requires this. And many folks that have been working in this have been trying to get that reformed and eliminated because it adds an extra burden and an extra penalty than no other crop insurance policy requires. There's a new micro program and the details did come out yesterday, but I'm not gonna talk about it, but it's a, a special program that makes a little bit the paperwork easier, but the, it only covers farms whose gross revenue are between 120,000 if you're a new applicant or if you're historically had, anyway, if you're over the, that amount, you're not eligible for the micro addendum. It's not a new policy. It's part of whole farm revenue. It just has different provisions, which we could go into some other time, another webinar for that. Um, what does it cost? Depends on the variability of your historical approved revenue. This will become clear in the example later. But if you have, um, if you have high variability in your revenue, that means your average and your smooth average are likely to be lower than maybe the year in which you insured. It will sh show you how that works, but it does affect um, uh, what it costs and what it covers. Depends on how different your expected revenue in the insurance year is compared to your history. So if you suddenly had a, um, a lot more value in the current year compared to your history, it's going to assess and give you a revenue guarantee based on the historical number not the new one. And therefore it might cause you to not feel you're fully insured. You, again, we'll show you with the example. Depends on how many products you produce. Again, more is less premium because of that added risk up to seven. Depends on the relative expected value of what you produce. You could lose one crop entirely and still not see an indemnity payment. So let's say you had five things. It was $100,000 in revenue. Your guarantee is 85,000 but you have like most of your revenue comes from one crop. That crop, let's say does better and a few others do worse, but your overall history is not lower than your historical, then you don't see a payment because you're essentially your diversity compensated. But if you have a loss across all products or one is more important and you have a severe loss, then you will see an indemnity. So, so it isn't just, it's, it's again, it's ensuring your whole farm's revenue, not any specific crop. And I've done a lot of uh, examples and generally speaking, a whole farm revenue is less expensive than buying, if available, individual policy, revenue policies for each crop separately. However, you can mix and match these. You could take an individual policy, yield or risk, on one of your important crops and take a whole farm revenue policy over the whole farm. That's another thing that is doable with whole farm revenue. 
Um, the new in 2020 was a separate, what they call a direct market. And, and since the example of the farm we talked about is one that pretty much direct markets all of its things directly to consumers, you could probably use this and I'll show you how this works. Um, there must be at least two products though uh, that are direct marketed. Um, there's no need to list each item separately on your expected revenue to determine your, your revenue guarantee. What that, that just means that the burden of paperwork is a little less. Let's say you had 15 different products, but they were, or let's say seven of them or all of them were direct marketed. You could include this as one commodity and not have to list them separately. Again, eliminating and lowering paperwork. If all products are direct marketed, then you only get a commodity count of two and that automatically limits you, unfortunately, to only 75% coverage. So there is a downside a little bit to using the direct market. It might be easier to apply and to manage, but it, the coverage is not as good. Um, it requires providing sales records for the last three years, uh, including certifying the total acres representing all those products. So what that means is that you, to determine your expected revenue is really based on your historical average, not on the specific crops or their potential price, which could also affect whether you'd be interested. Uh, expected value is the average of those revenues. So this is a, a side option for the direct marketer. It's been very not very uh, well used or even known uh, that's available. So let's get to an exact example. This is the original revenue history and it's adjusted. Don't worry about that. Your agent can help you with that adjustment. Again, it, those value added things have to be sorted out. But anyway, this is the gross revenue. And you can see the average, the straight average is 798,000. Now, <laughs> this is something we, we, that I think is helpful. Basically you, have, basically, you have options to look at for choosing what, what you're, how you're gonna deal with this history. You can do something called the 60% replacement. 60% of your average is this. If, if there is a year in which one of these would have been below or equal to 479, you can plug that in. In this case, that 60% replacement does nothing because all, basically because the revenues are close enough that, that, that you don't do that 60% replacement. Another option you can look at, and you have to run these for, for your farm all three times, is you take and kick out the lowest year, and then you divide by the, what's remaining, and that gives you 865. So if you want coverage, you know, you want to cover for the maximum amount you can cover. So you would, in this case, uh, probably pick the lowest year. Oh, there is one more option called the 90% option. If you had whole farm revenue in the past, and you take 90% of that approved revenue historically, you can also use that as an option. So 801 could have been another option, but this is the one we're gonna use because this one gives you the maximum coverage uh, based on what the economic capacity of the farm is to generate a gross revenue. So in the expected year, this is uh, the one example, the first example, oh look, the four acres of strawberries, tomatoes, pumpkins, you can see the acreage and the combined direct market. This could be a, many, many various things. And they, they generate up to 150,000 in gross revenue. Um, again, this is where I got some, these assumptions are down here, um, whether these are accurate or not, or these are realistic prices and yields for a particular farm in Arkansas, I don't know. I got them from various sources. It's hard to get some of these numbers, but it doesn't matter for the example. We have 10 acres and it's, expecting to generate $832,000 in the year of insurance. So if you did the combined direct marketing, in other words, everything was combined into one direct marketed product, it would be the same number. It would simply be 10 acres and 832,000, and you only have to list it once. So you don't have to go through all the bother of listing each, each one separately. So there's some advantage there. But again, you don't get the same potential level of coverage. So let's go. So we got 865,500 historic approved revenue and 832. Here's the kicker. The revenue guarantee, what you're gonna be insured should you have a loss is always the lower of the historic and the expected. So in this case, that's the expected 832. That is the revenue guarantee. 
which means that if you take 85% coverage times the revenue guarantee, this is the trigger number. In other words, until this farm has a loss in revenue that will be demonstrated in their tax taxes filed of below $707,285, they don't see a dime of insurance. So that is a sense, a kind of deductible if you think about it. 50, you know, you have to go beyond that. Loss required before any payment is, is so in other words, I just took the difference between those. So you have to have $124,000 of revenue loss before you see. And again, the cause of that revenue loss could be yield or price changes. Again, it's determined by our tax records. The total premium is $119,000 for this program if, if taxpayers didn't subsidize it. But because of the subsidy, you would have to pay 52,000 for that coverage. Is that fair? Is that reasonable? All I'm giving you is the number. I don't know. That's, that's a lot of money. But then again, you know, you could have significant losses. And that's up to you to decide. Um, if we use the direct market category before, which added some ease of application, again, still the same lower of the two, but now you can only get 75% coverage. So it, basically you have to have $208,025 worth of losses before you see a dime from the policy. However, the because it's a lower, because the list is it's a lower coverage, the premium is, is um, less. So I, I compared these, if you do the mixed direct marketing at 85, um, and you had a 50% loss, a revenue loss, uh, your, um, your indemnity payment would be 291,000. Um, so your actual revenue with insurance is that, subtracting the cost of the insurance is 654,000. In other words, you would actually see 640,000 and you would be brought up to that amount. So essentially a 21%. If you look at doing it, if it was an all direct farm, you would say it's similar, but you would see that the coverage isn't because the coverage is lower, even for the same value. Um, you again, you're 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 with a 50% loss. You you're not you're never wholly covered. But in this case, this the mixed direct marketing um, did better with a 50% loss. So there's some fine print things that are very important to point out. Reporting requirements of paper can be very onerous, especially if you have a lot of products to account for. Uh, nurseries require inventory assessment as well as subtract the value of the inventory remaining. That can cause problems because you have an inventory when you begin, an inventory when you sell, you have to take off the, of the revenue that wasn't generated. That, that can add, uh, if, if you have 15 different crops that have to be accounted for, that can be, um, um, that can, that, that's a lot of accounting and you have to have good paperwork. So you have to do this back five years, theoretically. The crop insurance company and their agents has the power to ask for even more records than simply your tax forms. And I wanna point this out, if they have reasons. For instance, a schedule off or equivalent tax form should be sufficient to determine your historical revenue, but an agent, an AIP can ask for more but if they do ask for more validation, you should ask them why they require that validation. I have been trying to figure out why they allow the agents and the AIPs to require that extra validation beyond the tax records. And I have yet to get a good reason, but they are supposed to provide you a reason for why they want you to add extra paperwork. Um, again, the micro program is coming and I'll have more details on that as we did. If you're going to buy it, the sale closing date for um, for this coming year is the 22828. So that's coming coming up for you. If you want to explore this, you can go to your find a crop and agent and go look at and have them run the numbers for you. Uh, finding an agent is easy. I could go to that and show you. It's on the RMA website. It's a nice locator. It helps you locate uh, approve you know AIPs and agents in your state or and, and it even does it by mileage. The ones you can find closest. But I would, um, my advice in, in these many years is to shop around and make sure you have an agent that is going to help you. We have found with whole farm revenue policies, a lot of crop insurance agents don't like to do it because it's a little bit more work. 
and, and many of them aren't familiar with it. And they might try to actually <laughs> draw you away from it, but they are required by law. Uh, if you want them to run uh, 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 you know, the whole farm revenue protection policy on your farm with your data, they, they need to do that. However, if they're not you know, that interested in it, you don't wanna work with somebody um, that doesn't really want to sell you the product. So try to, to look around and find somebody who will work with you uh, rather than someone who's gonna to try to sell you something else. So some conclusions, again, Explore alternatives uh, for the crops or lives products you grow. Sometimes revenue or yield policies for individual crops are available in your county and you should consider them as another option. Uh, how variable has your gross revenue been over the last three years? Remember, it's the lower of your historic and your current. And if there's big differences between them, since it's the lower, that can affect the magnitude of loss you have to have before you see any uh, payback from the policy. So you, you need to really look at that carefully. Um, and I really do think, and I've been, we've been trying through the National State of Iowa Coalition and other groups for, I think, going on four years now to reform this program to make it much less burdensome than it is. Um, but again, AVINES must legally provide it. But again, you don't want to work with an agent who's not really interested in selling. Well, Farm Avenue, I think is, has not worked out well because of the burdensome paperwork and we've been trying to, to figure out and offer uh, ways to fix that. Again, if you have seven or less products, there is a premium discount um, and it varies by the particular crops you're growing. And, and again, if you have 30 crops, I, I actually have done research in this and there are people historically that I've had up to 62 different products and they had to go through and list every single one and their expected price and all of that record keeping and they still applied for a whole farm revenue. But it's a lot a lot more burdensome when you have 62 crops to, to, to keep track of and through the application product. Um, contracted products, if you contract products that might help because it basically, uh, the it gives you a sense of what your expected price will be and you have an actual number that can be used rather than an estimate on an average or some estimate from some other source and again the extra value added product can be an issue um you know this is a extreme precipitation which is essentially you know abnormal one day precipitation events in the united states and unfortunately, the trend line is up. And so there's a lot of risk out there. Uh, and a major intensive rain event can wipe out a crop. And whole farm revenue, at least, it may not be ideal, but it provides something for that, those extreme cases. Here's the RMA website. You can see here the find an agent uh, button. You can also do the, the tools, has the map, the map viewer I showed you. You can actually estimate the cost of a policy if you know how to use it. That may be a future uh, webinar. And questions and comments. And thank you. And I'll stop sharing. Here's some more links that will be on there. We have a great website um, with lots of products, uh, with lots of uh, after publications on crop insurance. So any questions? Any in the chat? Anybody write in the chat? I have a comment. Go ahead. If I could. Sure, Kara. Um, so when you mentioned that agents sometimes are reluctant to sell whole farm revenue protection, Correct. um, that's something that we hear about too at RMA, but a lot of what we hear is, um, is sort of stories about someone else talking about it. And we don't get a lot of direct information about that. So I would just like to encourage folks that if that happens to them to contact their um, risk management agency, regional office and tell us about it because that'll yeah, help us, um, to address the problem. Yeah, Kara, I will. Um, we did a five year project called Is Organic Farming Risky? And we actually did a national survey of crop insurance agents, including questions about whole farm revenue. And so that's actual data, <laughs> you know, from actual people, uh, you know, actual surveys of crop insurance agents. And I would say it was split about 50 50 uh, between people who liked it, thought it was a new area of business, seemed relatively okay with, you know, they realized it was a little harder to do, but want to do it. And then it was about 50% that absolutely hated it. And you could just tell from the way they answered, and I'll share that with you and anyone else, um, 
that survey is fairly interesting. And I think it's the only study that was ever done where we actually asked actual agents the, you know, what they felt about whole farm revenue in general. And actually we asked them about how dealing with organic farming, because that's also confusing. Um, but, but we have some pretty good data on that. And it was split 50-50. Um, but yes, a lot of the evidence is anecdotal. And, and we have some empirical data too to back it up. But, uh, but it's one way to think of it is if you're a young agent and you need to develop a client base, uh, you often find that the younger people are kind of eager who need to develop their business as crop insurance agents. They're more apt to be interested in, in selling whole farm revenue because they can develop clients over time. Where there's people that have been doing kind of standard stuff for a long time ago, they don't like to go there because they don't have to because they already have clients selling individual policies. So that's one reason they don't tend to go there. And the effort to do it I think is real, but it can be learned. It's not impossible to learn how to, how to do a, a whole farm revenue policy. I wish they would make it simpler. We've been trying to do that for four years to make it simpler so that it, it would be more available to folks. But, um, but, it, but, but, but yes, there's, and there, there's actually another problem with the adjusters. Um, the adjusters, when you have a claim, they are not familiar with whole farm revenue either as well. And so adjustment can be an issue too on the other end. Just an FYI. Yeah, yeah um, that's a good point. And thanks for letting me know about that survey. I'll, I'll drop my um, email in the yeah, chat. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it. I'll send you the link to that. So it's, it's a great study. I'm very proud of it. it took five years. Yeah. To do. <laughs> I've, actually sure I've actually shared it with the actuarial uh, the head of actuarial with the risk management agent at, in Washington D.C. They all have copies of it. <laughs> oh, I don't know if they. I'm glad I don't know if they. It. I don't know if they read it, but I, I did get it. <laughs> you no, know, that's really good to know. And then, okay. as the micro as the micro farm policy um, comes out and, uh, you know, as people are purchasing it or trying to purchase it, we'd love to hear about how that's going to, and that, you know, that's for um, farms up to a hundred thousand dollars or uh, 125 if they're returning. So it's, um, it does have less, the less burdensome paperwork requirement, um, but it is kind of a new audience with those smaller farms. So we'd love to yeah. get any feedback on that too. Yeah. Yeah. I just read, I just read the details yesterday because they just came out yesterday. I have I have some opinions, but I'm still working and thinking about them. But yes, I think it'll be a new area for us to do some education outreach on as well. Jeff, uh, we have a Mr. Paul Myers that wants sure. to know more about the more he wants. He's interested in more info on the new micro program. Okay, yeah, basically. The two things that really, well, first of all, it's limited in the gross amount of your historic revenue. If you're a continuing customer of whole farm revenue and you had a, like an approved revenue of $125,000 or less, then you're eligible for the micro addendum. It's an addendum. It's not really changing the policy. It's, a, it's not a new policy. It's an addendum to the policy. So you have to be, first of all, you have to be, or if you're a new user of whole farm revenue, your historic revenue has to be $100,000 or less. So it's, it's, a, it's for, a small, for farms that are smaller in terms of their gross revenue capacity. And once you go over that capacity, you're no longer eligible for the micro program. The two other advantages in the paperwork is the expense requirement is not required. So in other words, they've just said, we're not gonna deal with that expense thing, which I should think they should have got rid of for the whole policy, but for this micro policy, you do not have to track expenses. Unfortunately, on the other side, my understanding of it, and again, I should be careful because it's pretty new, but I understand is still there's gonna be paperwork to substantiate, unfortunately, you're, you're gonna still have to have schedule Fs, you're still going to have to substantiate records and to determine the expected revenue is going to be an average of your historic revenue and not individually estimated expected prices. It'll just be a simple average of your history that will give you the determinative revenue guarantee. So that, that does, you know, but there's still paperwork involved. There's still the Schedule F questions and additional paperwork that can be requested by the agent to verify your historic records and your expected records. So there's some limitations. And again, importantly, it's limited 
to only a, to those folks that are 100 or 125,000 or less gross revenue. That's the best summary I can give it of it right now. Uh, there might be some other details that um, are a little more arcane and crazy, but I have to review them. But, but it's just an addendum. So it's not an entirely new process. It just makes it a little bit easier for this category of folks. And again, you don't have to list out every single crop too. It's just going to be one code. So that's another advantage paperwork wise. I should have said that too. Yeah. Kind of like the direct marketing idea. Yeah, we have, you know, we have plenty more questions. If any, we plenty more time if anyone have any questions. And you can contact me. I, I, I love answering questions about crop insurance. I really do. <laughs> and I like to hear everybody's individual cases. So call our ATRA 100 number. Uh, it'll come to me or call Mike or email me directly. I'm always happy to okay. uh, discuss the policies with folks. Okay, Jeff's info is inside of the, his email as well as his contact info to the offices uh, in the chat. In the chat too. It's yeah. just easy. It's jeffs at ncat.org. You always go by a first name in the. Thank God it's not Shazinski. That would drive everybody crazy. <laughs> My last name is very long. So Jeff S at NCAT.org. And I really appreciate it. If anybody has experience attempting to get it and issues, I like to, to learn as much as I can about uh, how it goes when you try to buy whole farm revenue. I've been, like I said, I've been working on this specific po policy. For, I guess it's the 19th year. So um, I've I've seen a lot of different things <laughs> and it's always good to learn more and 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 I, and I have great hopes for it to be, you know, really offering the kind of, there's so many folks that are not covered by insurance, especially crop farmers, as I mentioned. But if you think about what happened in Texas this year when they had this polar vortex, and there's many of these events, and there were only two whole farm revenue policies sold in Texas that year. And I keep thinking if a thousand farmers had whole farm revenue during that year, they might not have been some of those farms are absolutely totally destroyed um, and, and ruined. And, and they had no options for crop insurance for their specific crops. And it, if they could have had whole farm revenue policy, of course, it's always easy to say <laughs> the year when your house burns down, you wish you had insurance. <laughs> but, <laughs> but nonetheless, yeah, there are a lot of farmers out there uh, of all kinds that don't have options except for whole farm revenue. And yet it's not being used enough. So it's been my kind of life's mission <laughs> to make this work for folks because I think everybody needs some degree of protection for that, those kind of things. And I think unfortunately the future is not, you know, is these extreme events are occurring more and more. You can look at that agris viewer. You can see the historic causes of loss for your particular county by using that tool. And it's, it's an amazing thing to look at, you know, it, um, it shows you trends and, and how things are moving. And unfortunately, what, what I'm seeing is a lot of variability from year to year, but with a trend line of upward, meaning there have been more severe and more causes of loss across a lot of states in the United States and very limited insurance for a lot of folks growing a lot of different things. Well, yeah. thank you. All right. Well, this is the end of our workshop and um, we'd like to thank you all for coming back and please, if, there any, if there's anything in the future, or if you have any other questions that you would like to ask Jeff, um, please feel free to reach out uh, to him or myself and um, we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.